Let's do this. And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. This is available on iTunes and Stitcher at Pacifica Radio Network. You can check out past shows at opednews.com slash podcast, and there are over 400 of them. My guest for this show is Julia Hobsbawm. She is an expert in connectedness and the author of the book, Fully Connected, Social Health in an Age of Overload, which was shortlisted for Business Book of the Year Award for 2018. She's an honorary visiting professor at Cass Business School and at the University of Suffolk and founded the knowledge networking firm, Editorial, Editorial Intelligence. Great to have you on the show. Hello. Hello from London. Yes. Uh, so, do you have a website that you'd like to share with people? Sure. It's uh, juliahobsbaum.com. So, J U L I A H O B S B A W M.com. That has a lot of my material on it, lots of links, many interviews and extracts. Um, I also write articles for strategy and business magazine so that's on their website and i'm editor at large for ariana huffington's portal thrive global so i can be found can't we all in this connected age oh we've got a, a ariana huffington connection so cool uh, so let's get started because we've got a limited amount of time and we've got a little bit of a late start here why did you write this book so this book was 10 years in my head. Um, I've always been involved in communications. Uh, my own personal career totally accidentally spanned analog to digital, telex to Twitter. Most millennials don't know what a telex is or was. It's think of an obese typewriter and you're halfway there. So I've always been interested in communication and the history of, of, of communications and media. Um, I used to be interested more in the relationship between PR and journalism. So I wrote and consulted about that for a long time. And then I basically fell in love with networks, network science, uh, quite a lot of what you've been writing about in your chapter on connectivity and your very fine book, Rob. Um, and I began to study networks and... I was then given the honorary title of visiting professor in networking, which I have to tell you, back in the day when everybody was drinking the social network Kool-Aid, uh, people thought was a joke. Um, I, think, I think somebody interviewed me for what was then the International Herald Tribune, and they were pretty sneery. Oh, a professor in networking, how, you know, not how ridiculous, but isn't that quaint? Somebody who's interested in face-to-face -face connection and networks rather than in, uh, um, uh, in, in, you know, in what you might call top-down uh, hierarchical uh, mass connection. So all of this interested me. And then I felt it was suddenly time in around 2015 when I could sense the shift that we're now right in the middle of, the backlash, if you like, the tech lash, where we're beginning to want to ask deeper questions about connectivity and connectedness and its discontents. So I hope that isn't too long an answer for you. No, I, I love the word tech lash. Describe that. Okay, well, I would say the definition of tech lash is that extraordinary moment in... Uh, gosh, was it 2018? I think it was, it might have been 2017. At the mouth of the, uh, the Thai caves where those, those 11 footballers got trapped in the rising um, tides of a cave and the whole world held its breath really for 10 days while they thought they were lost. What actually saved those boys was an incredible meshed human network of old technology, um, and new technology, sonar radars, and uh, you know all the old, uh, but but also experts in um, uh, deep uh, deep sea caving, deep dive caving, but also literally a network of humans, all who had different skills that brought together and brought those boys out, pretty much against the odds. It's of course being made into a movie. The tech clash comes like this: who was standing at the mouth of the cave? 
holding metaphorically a rigid technology enabled submarine saying this is the answer mr elon musk and everybody went mm, i don't think so and it was just at the moment i mean he's a very very interesting guy elon musk but this was just at the moment when he was um stressed out had no social health as i would call it which i'm happy to describe to you because that's really what i write about in the book but elon yeah. musk certainly had no social health at the time was basically melting down was making lots of pronouncements in the media so it was the moment when people turned away from the technologist as superhero and began to say mm, hang on a minute and of course it coincided with all the disasters that facebook has encountered uh, and so on. So tech clash, I think, is that moment in the last couple of years where instead of everything glittering in a golden way, we've begun to mistrust and question everything that technology can do. And I have to say, even though I welcome all the tech, here am I on a Zoom call with you, Rob, we're embedded in it, it's not going to go away. But I welcome the tech clash. I think we need to start asking much more important questions about what connectedness means what disconnection means uh in order to stay functional and productive and creative and well in this 21st century and i think i, I want you to get into that but the one thing that i want to observe is the alternative to elon musk's high-tech submarine was a collective action that you described right. it was right. a, it was a whole bunch of people working at a level of effectiveness that yeah. might have been undoable before and maybe the tech helped to enable them to connect with each other but it was all those people connected together collectively cooperating that made it all work which is what i talk about about bottom up yep yeah it is pretty bottom up i mean networked behavior which is obviously comprehensively different from networking networked behavior uh, you you cite Manuel Castells, the Network Society. There's 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 an under acknowledged literature around networks and the social science of networks that's beginning to surface now. If if I achieve nothing else with the book, it, it, it's I, I have produced a pretty extensive record of almost every interesting paper and book that has been written about networks and human networks over the last um, hundred years or so and the science of networks. So I hope it serves at the very minimum as a primer. So explain the difference between networking and networks, just to be clear for listeners. And well, networking is, um, is an activity that essentially has come out as a transactional activity uh, generated really by a very rapacious uh, form of capitalism, which many of us have been and remain actually engaged in, where it was about working the room and reaching as many people as possible. And it, it sort of originated actually in American large scale conferences where, you know, your country is so big uh, compared to my little country that you, if you go to a conference or a symposium, you, you're really going for several days meeting thousands of people. Now you might have an app that can help you geolocate other people from your district and so on and so forth. But in the early days, conferences and networks, um, networking happened uh, as a sort of necessity for selling. And so networking became part of that era of, I believe, I'm happy to be challenged or to stand corrected, but I believe that networking became normalized as a form of promotion, selling, self-promotion. And the concept of working the room really ran unquestioned for a long time. I came along and I, I actually gave a, 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 a mini TED talk before it became um, uh, TEDx and so on and so forth. Hundreds of years ago, I gave a talk um, at something called TED U, um, which uh, I have since given a, a, a TEDx that's, that's on YouTube. But I talked about um, connectedness and shyness and shyness in networking and how even an apparent extrovert like myself walks into a room and thinks, oh, golly, get me out of here, you know, I'm not having a good day, or I've, I've got imposter syndrome, I have nothing to say, or just feeling overwhelmed. You don't have to be 
Susan Cain, a self-avowed introvert, to experience intense anxiety, raised cortisol levels, at the idea that you have to sort of sell yourself. I mean, who likes that, right? And so I wanted to look a little bit more deeply at why we were um, rubbishing a whole set of human behaviors to do with connecting intimately and productively, which is even what you and I are doing uh, through the video conference, which is we are looking into each other's faces. We are actually um, being intimate, enabled by technology. Networking is not intimate. Networking is about almost disconnecting from what you feel and who you are. Networking is based very much around the idea of a hierarchy, that the more important your business card is, the better transacting power you have. And I wanted to reframe that. I wanted to talk about what are the anxieties when you walk into a room? What, what kind of room should you be in in the first place? And that led me on to reading up and understanding about networks. And there's a couple of really fascinating aspects of network science, uh, which I think are worth sharing with you now. One you allude to in your, in your own book, Rob, um, but it's a theory that has a wonderful name uh, coined by a sociologist called Ronald Burt called brokerage and closure. And it's essentially about the distance between connections that you have that are strong or weak or long or short. And it's really about the space in between. In other words, it's about diversity. So the science of networks shows that it is, is in fact, the, the, the worst thing is to find so-called homophily and find everybody who agrees exactly the same with your worldview and go and huddle up in a room or a conference with them. The best form of networks are those that are diverse and porous, different um, ethnicities, genders, ages, experiences. Now that interested me because of course the whole culture of corporate networks for a long time has been very siloed. Um, women's networks, I mean, you would expect me possibly as a fully paid up member of the feminist class to be very pro women's networks. I am only to a degree. I actually think that self-reinforcing exclusion networks can also be difficult. I recognize the need for women's networks has been to empower and support and so on. So the first point about networks, um, I think to, to understand and to apply that into networking is that diversity really, really matters. You know, get with old people if you're young, get with people of a different social class, get with people from a different um, practice within your company. Um, you know, Rob Cross, who's a very interesting network scientist has proved uh, that essentially, you know, the telephone receptionist or the, or the receptionist or the PA to the chief executive is quite often the best, uh, the best networked. You know, it's not the guy with the corner office. So diversity in networks is really important. And the second point, which I just love, is that we all think about networks as, and networking as being better done at scale. That's what the LinkedIn founders think. That's what Facebook thinks. That's what any, any algorithm-led business that wants to enjoy network effects thinks. More is better. Faster is better. Um, what, the, um, what the science shows is, is, is something slightly different, that the higher trust comes in smaller groups, specifically groups um, that mimic the old villages, the old uh, configurations. So this is where the so-called Dunbar number comes in, the anthropological maximum number of individuals uh, that we can really hold in our overall network at any one time, which is 150. Um, and going along with that is, is, is really another interesting fact about networks, which is it's, um, it's randomness. It's not just that the more you know, the more your network expands and, a, and, a, and an expansion of, 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 of Moore's law and Metcalfe's law about capacity and scale. It's about the fact that I don't even know how you came across my work, Rob, uh, but I don't think it was necessarily that 
my US publicist approached you. You know, there's serendipity no. in life. No, it was, find... uh, you were on NPR and I heard you on NPR. Okay. So what I'm saying is there's another great piece of sociological research done in 1973 by Mark Granavetta, who wrote a seminal paper called The Strength of Weak Ties. And what that means is the person you speak to in the bus queue or when you're waiting for the plane, maybe the person that changes your life. And so what I object to about the old model of networking is first of all, that it overlooks any of the science at all. It just says work the room and be linear and go for as much scale. But secondly, that it underestimates the, um, the nuance, which is, you have to stay human in those situations and flinging your business cards out at as many people as possible in an hour and a half networking drinks reception is probably the worst thing you can do. Have I made my anti-networking point clearly enough? Well, you have, but when I think of networks, it's not necessarily a face-to-face -face thing either. Yeah. So. Well, I belong to many networks social networks are a game changer and in fact i i support facebook strategy as i understand it of moving much more into communities and away from news feeds kind of out of the news business so much as enabling different different diverse communities to flourish how would um, that work how, how how would facebook change well, so, what would be better about that well so we are we are clearly in a world of niches and niche interests and specialized interests and and that's that's where networks do come into their own um so for example i'm involved in a in a non-profit that was started in the us by a british woman called jessica morris called our brain bank she uh, suffered a glioblastoma collapse um the the uh, and um the same the same kind of brain cancer that killed uh, John McCain. She wrote, wrote about it in her own tumor in uh, the New York Times. Jessica set up an app uh, called um, Our Brain Bank to help patients with glioblastoma, this very rare, very deadly form of brain cancer, to help patients and their carers monitor the symptoms um, and gather data that are gonna be useful for clinicians. Uh, they have come alive on a Facebook group. They hold regular Zoom meetings that connect people all over the country that would otherwise be isolated. So I'm not dismissing network effects. I'm saying let's hold the truth of the behavior of network effects and actually start to calibrate our behavior accordingly. And okay, so, so these so groups is good. So, so how do we make networks healthy? Because I think, you know, your subtitle is social health in an age of overload. How do we make networks and networking something that's healthier and good for us and good for community? Well, I certainly think that networks is, is, is one aspect of what I call social health. So here's the thing. We're in the middle of what has been called the triple revolution of the internet social and mobile. We are really only a generation into that revolution. And within that time period, we have experienced uh, what Francis Cancross memorably called the death of distance. In other words, the computer has moved from being way over there in a server storage somewhere, way over in the back of the room, to being in the room, to being on the desktop, then in the laptop, and now, right, you know. Right on the wrist. Right on the wrist. And that, that mobility uh, has, has obviously been a complete game changer. And what that has correlated with, the arrival of the death of distance, the arrival of mobile, that has correlated very specifically with an uptick in not just... Um, many disorders and anxieties around attention, for example, but also um, in the workplace, which really interests me greatly, into stress. And so you have a $300 billion cost to the American economy every year from stress. 60% of working days in Europe um, are lost to stress. 15 million working days in the UK are lost to stress. And those numbers are only rising productivity is not rising 
it's stagnant. So we clearly have some kind of disorder or dysfunction connected to all of this connection. Okay, so we want to need to we need to do a very brief uh, break for show ID. Count to ten. Tell us about connection disorder and what the answer is to it and what the problem okay. is. So I would say there is a connection disorder that we have a we have an infobesity crisis like we have an obesity crisis. We have an excess and a surfeit of stimulation, information, connected devices. And whilst I'm not in any way a Luddite trying to break up the uh, technology of today, um, I do think that we have to regard our um, relationship to technology in a very similar way to the way we look at our relationship to nutrition and to exercise. In other words, to regard it as a health issue. I would, I would add drugs. I would add addictive drugs as well. Well, the World Health Organization is 70 years old. At another turning point moment for the world after um, World War II, the World Health Organization, a subset of the UN, was created. The definition of health hasn't changed in 70 years, which I think is a bit Odd, actually, I have been and talked to the World Health Organization that they probably need to modernize and change their um, definition. But it's this, that health uh, is not merely the absence of injury and disease, but the presence of physical, mental and social well-being. Well, social well-being 70 years ago meant class. It meant life chances through poverty. It didn't mean being on a connected device uh, 14 hours a day. It didn't mean picking up your mobile phone 80 times a day. You only have to read the research from the Pew Research Center to show just how anxious adults and teenagers are about their use. However, there's a bright spot because even though we clearly have many, many health problems and even though the modernity of the last 70 years have created more sedentary lifestyle, sugar, for example, nevertheless, we all understand that there are only three factors to physical and mental health uh, around the world. And those are nutrition, i.e. diet, exercise and sleep. That is the trio of factors. Any healthcare practitioner, those have become embedded in the culture. I bet you've counted a carb or a calorie in your life, have you, Rob? Of course. Okay, you've got a Fitbit. We're, we're all literate. It used to be a very out there thing. You know, Jane Fonda was a trailblazer, but now we're all Jane Fonda. We all exercise uh, constantly and have a literacy. So my question to myself when I wrote the book was, what if our connectedness needed a similar simple recipe? What if it needed, what would the three factors to being healthily, productively connected, whether you're an organization or an individual, so quite a big question. And I came up with three. I call it the not. Knowledge, networks, and time. So your networks are in there. But knowledge, we know that the knowledge economy is somewhat in crisis. Uh, there's too much of it. We don't trust it. There's not only fake news. There's deep fake. Uh, there is... Um, it's not even about the lack of regulation. There's just... We, we need ever tighter forms of curation and trust in information. You talk about time starvation. Time starvation. The big one is time. When I give talks, I've given probably a couple of hundred talks since my book was published all around the world. And I talk to them about big numbers. Uh, you know, the 10 million uh, messages exchanged on Messenger every, every day and the two and a half billion emails a day and the 50 billion connected devices by 2030. And everybody sort of shrugs, Rob. Everybody's up with the big numbers. And then I say, there are three numbers that unite everybody on the planet all the time. What are those numbers? 150, 168, and 200. These are small numbers. They don't have many zeros. We've covered one of them, 150. That's the anthropological maximum number of relationships. 
200 is roughly speaking, it changes all the time, but roughly speaking, the number of functional recognized nations in the world. So 150, 200, it's pretty similar. What is the number 168? We all live with that number all the time. I tell you, in 200 talks, 99.5% of my audience never puts their hand up. Um, it's the number of hours in the week. You can't stretch it. So we are living with an enormous disconnect where we have this limitless computer capacity, limitless busyness, but we don't have more time. So our knowledge flows are um, strangled and bloated and obese, in my view, just like a kind of blocked artery. Our networks are tangled and disrupted and unclear and unhygienic. They are often you know, full of groupthink. I'll, I'll and, throw one at you. You call it infobesity. How about K N O W B C D? No B C D. <laughs> oh, I like what you did there. I like what you did there. Um, and time. We are stalked by time poverty. So, for me, in the same way that diet, exercise, sleep, we absolutely know that these are the bedrock that underpin good health. We and you talk this. about you talk about Maslow's hierarchy and how it leaves out connection and how it needs to be put in. Yes. So throw that so, in there. So, so when you're talking about networks in particular, I have um, absolutely uh, pinched from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the pyramid. Um, and I noted, first of all, the connection itself is not, is not listed, but, but you could argue that, that, that connection is in there called something else. But what really interested in me, me was, yeah, what would be, um, but you need to show my one. That is yours. Oh, no, yours is, my, no, mine is the hierarchy of communication. Yes, yes, that's next. That's, uh, here you go. Yes, I know my own illustrations. Thank you very much. Very good. That's it, the hierarchy of communication. And so I wanted to be very specific that, I mean, you and I, as it happens, have spent quite a lot of time scheduling this interview and it takes time to do this interview and neuroscience shows that after you switch focus from one task to another it takes about 23 minutes to get your mojo back and to refocus on something else so what we're doing in time terms is expensive but it's well worth it right because it's a connection because it's intimate the problem with the way the world is constructed is to value the bottom of the pyramid, to value what is essentially a broadcast model. Now, I do think in terms of your bottom-up terminology, and I'm encouraged by this, that that's beginning to change. Um, I would even go out on a limb and say that there is a flattening in the rise of social networks. It doesn't mean that new social networks like TikTok won't come along and grow, but the idea that we are all in love with scaled, speeded, narcissistic, broadcast-based forms of communication uh, on those networks, I'm not sure we'll be seeing the like of it again. And that's because we are understanding innately that you have to put the human back into the machine era. And for me, social health is about reconnecting with the human in a highly technological era, the like of which, the proportions of which we've just never seen before. You know, it's funny. The last guest I had on was another Brit. His name is Kelvin Campbell, and his book is titled Massive Small. Yeah. I believe that, that we have a problem yeah. with bigness. There's way too much of it. And, and you're clearly saying that bigness applied to networks and connecting is problematic. Yes, I also think it's a kind of philosophical take. I mean, I think that corporations and governments and um, departments are very in love with bigness at what I would and what I would call grandiosity. And for me, we all need to find the balance between grandiose, which is often vision and ambition and you know good stuff. But also we need to balance that with what I would call the granular. Well, granular. let me ask you a question because we, we don't have that much time left and I want to make sure we get there. You do, a, you do consulting for businesses and organizations. How do you apply 
this idea from the book of social health fully connected how do you apply it okay well the first thing you have to uh, you have to say to the uh, the organizations i work with is you know houston do we have a problem or not you know is everything running smoothly have you got many of the corporations i i go to you know you're talking four five six percent of um turnover is wiped away by absenteeism uh you're talking about the massive cost of um of, of balancing the human skills against the technological. So the first thing they have to do is say, do we want to change a little bit? Do we not want to change? Or do we want to understand that we need to be fit to practice in a social and connected era? Now you're seeing it all over the place. I'm not there to tell companies that we consult with. Um, I, I have a consultancy called socialhealth.expert. We're not there to say, you've got to start at the beginning. What we want to do is help them identify what they're already doing. Uh, nobody loses uh, 28 pounds uh, in 28 days and thinks that that's a great idea anymore. It's all about incremental. It's all about lifestyle changes. It's all about recognizing what you already do. It's all about recognizing the psychology and the culture. And certainly I'm very encouraged by the fact that the doors are very much opening in a way that they absolutely were not five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago. What are the problems? What are the problems that you're seeing companies and organizations having that you can address? Well, I, I, first of all, I think anyone interested um, might want to pick up the book and take a deeper dive into these ideas. I'm not here to, to, to sort of sell my, flog my wares to you, actually. And my guest for the show is Julia Hobsbawm, and her book is Fully Connected, Social Health in an Age of Overload. Um, I, you look, my favorite joke is how many Californian psychoanalysts does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. So, you know, if you're an HR director, a people director, if you're a CEO, um, it, it, you, do you have an issue where the technology marrying with your people is causing stress or anxiety or difficulty? Or are you just madly gung-ho to get that AI in as quickly as possible, get those robots in and send everybody else home? I can't answer that question. But most brilliant leaders... They want a sense of well-being and wellness. And to be frank with you, with all respect to people that practice and teach mindfulness, which, by the way, I practice, it's an outlier for social health. It's not the end of the story. Corporate well-being can't be just about saying, you're the worker, you can bring your stress, your mental health problems into the office, and we will support you with mindfulness. It's about saying, are we contributing to your stress? Are we overloading you with technology and decision-making that outstrips the reality that you've only got a third of your time out of those 168 hours a week in which you can possibly be functionally working? So it's really about alignment and balance. It actually takes its inspiration, as so much does, whether it's Jeff Sachs or Douglas Rushkoff, I, too, take my inspiration from Aristotle, from the holistic arete, from the concept in the fourth century of flourishing, of an alignment between the mind, the body, the spirit. And we need a similar set of energetic, realistic strategies and practices around social health and around social connectedness. Because if we don't, we are just going to tune out and burn out. We're now you talk about more burnout. You talk about flourishing, and you know I've been involved with positive psychology for over thirty years. And uh, where does where what's the overlap between what you're talking about and positive psychology, if any? Well, I'm particularly interested in action rather than just thought. So I do think you can train your mind, and positive psychology and mindfulness are all part of that. But I'm really interested in behavior. Um, I'm interested in how we act and behave differently. In other words, here's the thing. 
what if instead of dress down Friday, which nobody really does anymore, but it was a big thing for a long time in corporate culture. What if you had face to face Fridays? What if you said there's one day a week when you know you just can't connect with anybody online and you have to find someone that you normally reply all to and you phone them up and you walk down the corridor and you have a cup of coffee with them. So I'm talking about bearable, tangible, measurable practices. I would like social health to be measured in organizations like people's body mass index. I would like, if you're gonna have a 360 degree review, not that I'm a fan of those appraisals, but if you're going to actually measure and monitor what being um, a productive and satisfied member of a workforce is, that you are asked about the strength and diversity of your networks. You are asked about how you curate and share knowledge. These are new measurements. Now we've done that with our bodies. We've become incredibly sophisticated about our mind and body health. We now need, as a matter of survival, to do so with our connected health. So and that's I, really where social health comes from. Do you agree? I, I absolutely agree. I, you know, if, if my book, uh, Bottom Up Revolution, which comes out next month, uh, my main message is that we need to develop bottom-up connection consciousness, which is the way that humans existed for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Where we're, 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 when we make decisions, we think about how it affects other people and, and the nature around us. And I think that that, and it's in a level, it's, there's a kind of an intensity to that consciousness that I think people in our modern technological world have doled. I never thought of it as doling, but really that's what it is. And I think what you're talking about in terms of curating knowledge and even curating connection is really a matter of intensifying it and being more aware of how we connect and the quality of our connecting and the intensity and the quantity of it as well. All of those things really. Very much so. And just to your point about, um, about connection, in corporate structures, and I go on about corporate structures mainly because most of us work. Most of us will spend 10,000 days of our lives working. And even if the um, uh, pattern of our working moves from being employed full-time to part-time to freelance, half of the world's workforce will be freelance um, by about 2030. But nevertheless, we are all gonna carry on working. This idea that the human being is gonna stop working or want to stop working, I'm afraid I don't buy that. And the, de and the demographies don't support that, by the way. You talk to someone like Hal Valerian at Google, um, the demographies are you need more and more people to carry on working. However, the, the reality is we need to do so in a way that reflects the new networks and the old hierarchy, the old boss in the corner office, that days are over, that day is over. Um, I uh, consult and I'm on the board of um, a think tank run by Kronos Incorporated, a capital management software company run out of, out of the US, but it's global. Um, and uh, they are consistently rated extremely highly amongst employees. Their boss, uh, Aaron Ayn, um, he calls himself an unleader. And I like that very much because the leader of today is in fact somebody who's just a member of the team. They are a member of a gang. They are a member of a network. And that to me is a massively important shift that we should, we should talk about more. It's really the philosophy and practice of connections, which is why in the middle of my knot, my triple knot of social health, of course comes networks flanked by knowledge and time. You know, you, you say that half of people are going to be uh, freelancing. And I mean, that's pretty much what I do. And I've been doing it for a long, long time. It means I commute from my bedroom to my living room. You're working, it looks like you're working at home from looking behind you. It's uh, seven and, o'clock at night in London, yeah. Oh, okay. So, but I mean, that means that a lot of people are working alone. They're not working in offices. They're not working with other people. It, it, that would suggest to me that they've got to make extra effort to connect on a regular Absolutely. basis. Absolutely. And so we, we know all sorts of challenges are being thrown up by 
the impact of technology on jobs and the end of the office as we knew it and the downscaling of full-time employment with all of those benefits and all of the community that goes with it. And we also know that to some degree, co-working spaces are, are for the lucky. You have to be able to afford the co-working spaces. And that if we're not careful, all we do is create beautiful coffee shops in co-working spaces rather than actual communities. There are some exceptions. There's a very interesting company called Second Home uh, that has uh, co-working spaces in, in the UK and in Europe and in America. But, um, you know, we need to think very hard about what community means at work. And it doesn't necessarily mean just being in the same space. It comes back to my point about doing. How are we doing networked behavior? Um, some, of the some of the big companies um, that have been... Uh, leading, leading some practices actually are, are, are American um, uh, and Walmart has, has had for years a, 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 a cross industry community where people can come and turn up and talk about problems they're having in their supply chain or you know problems that might need addressing. Coming back to my point about um, the Thai cat caves and how a network of experts from from literally from mountaineers who knew how to forage for the ingredients for bird's nest soup mixed well, with divers back so, to this diversity point of networks so let's one, one thing that companies want to know about is their bottom line how does addressing this looking at the quality of the network the quality of the connections the quality of the community within the workplace. How does that affect the bottom line? Well, I think there's two things to say on that, Rob. One is that the bottom line as it's perceived is changing. That's what all this talk about purpose in the corporation is. That's why you get uh, very, very distinguished academics like Jeffrey Pfeffer of Stanford talking about toxic culture and saying that um, you, you really the elephant in the room is that work and the corporation um, has got to really change its values if it wants to improve these outcomes. And alongside that comes the cost of not doing it. What does it cost you not to listen? What does it cost you not? Well, in the case of one company that I just um, interviewed their HR director for the other day, the top four reasons for absenteeism are stress and mental health. And that accounts for 4% of their turnover. Um, so quite apart from the ethics of it, it already affects the bottom line. Um, you want to have people whose time resource is well used, who have autonomy over time. I'm often asked, Julia, what's your one tip for social health? You know, give us tips, tips, tips. Well, I would say the one tip, if I had to kind of choose above all else, would be to treat your calendar and your schedule and your diary, whatever you call it, treat it like your body. Only put in it something that you believe is necessary and good. We don't let anybody else feed us. We don't take unsolicited drinks from people that might be spiked. Yet our time is constantly interfered with by other people. Our time is finite and precious. And so one of the best things we can do to reclaim our social health is to say, not just what's going into my calendar and my actual personal time, but what about the timeline? What about the deadline? Is the quarterly report viable anymore? Is the annual report viable anymore? You know, so we really need to become much more ambitious. And, and the corporate leaders that I talk to especially the ones that have a, a, a what's been called um, uh, the new G3 of the uh, CEO, the, uh, the CTO, uh, the, sorry, the chief executive officer, uh, the chief finance officer, and the chief um, human resources officer, the G3, the new trio of power at the corporations. What those organizations that recognize that well- balanced, managed, happy, productive talent is the main driver. They're saying not 
well, we're doing this and this and this and this. They're saying, what are we not doing? What can we do better? What are we learning? Does it work for us to have face-to-face -face Friday? Does it work for us to have an email ban on weekends? Does it not? Are we, what are we doing? And for some organizations, of course, it's absolutely bringing in more technology. I'm not anti the tech, but I'm not anti the human either. And I don't want us to talk about our society in terms of the capabilities of the technology at the expense of the human that has to operate it and live amongst it. And that really is what social health is about. The fundamental default of every healthy human brain, the, the position that we absolutely know now from neuroscience is unique to humans and to, it's not unique to humans actually, because there are social insects and um, primates we know a lot, about, a lot more about the animal kingdom. But the default position of the healthy human brain at rest is always and only concerned with one thing, which is its relationships. Who do I love? Who loves me? So we have to embed social connectedness and practices around our cognitive limit as humans, our relationship capacity and desire as humans, uh, and what we know and don't know in, in order to thrive. That's what it's all about, right? Thriving and surviving and being creative and productive. I love that. You know, I've, I've always thought that humans evolved to process stories, to tell them and to listen to them. And it's a form of starvation when you're talking about 140 or 280 characters, <laughs> which is Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think that, that the, the connection that you're talking about is, is something that it, it, it's, people have given up. They've sacrificed it. And they've, they've traded it for what? Well, what I'm a pessimistic optimist, Rob. So I am a pessimist. Of course, I could say the world is going to hell in a handcart, but I don't believe it is. I'm an optimist because I think that even these conversations show that people want change. They want to do things differently. They want to reconnect to the fundamental features of being human. And they want to recognize that the technology lives we lead need to be subservient to us at the very least, possibly on a good day partners, but not to overtake us. Priorities. So it's, it's priorities, it's reframing. It's also about having structure. And again, I come back to health. We've learned how to monitor and measure and practice and innovate in the way we manage what we consume in our bodies, what we do with our bodies physically and how we power down and rest. And Can we you... need to just go up a gear in terms of all of the technology and connectedness that we, we deploy. And it's not just individuals. Our concentration has, this conversation has focused very much effectively on individuals, but really what I'm interested in is, um, is systemic change too. S systemic. Tell me about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just give you an example. Boeing is facing an enormous crisis over the crash of two of its Max 8 jets. And uh, without wanting in any way to um, be, uh, make allegations that can't be substantiated and so, so, so and so forth, what appears to be the case is that there was a disconnect between the blind faith in the technology and the software and the ability and the training and the experiences of the pilots. That is a very good example of, of a calamitous failure. Now, air travel is in fact incredibly safe. So these two incidents happening so close to each other are a real warning shot that we must never ever forget that you need all the technology you can get with an autopilot, but my goodness me, you need the pilot there too. And you need to do a lot of testing. I mean, uh, I, I have a small experience of that because uh, my website, opendnews.com, is uh, my own content management system uh, designed by work, working with a programmer. And there are always unexpected consequences. You fix one thing and it causes another problem. And, and, it, and clearly, Boeing did not evaluate their software changes enough in terms of how it worked with pilots and with humans. And one final point I would make, and then I, I have to go off and have a very human uh, wedding anniversary dinner with my husband, actually. Um, 
uh, no 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 uh, mobiles allowed at the table but but one dreadful example of social health not being evident happened in the UK and happened with the Grenfell Tower fire this was the uh, tower block that um, that burned to the ground uh, a, a student of mine was in that tower block and died I was in mm. New York when I saw it on Twitter she was um, I run a very small scholarship program for um, young ethnically diverse Londoners and uh, she was a very gifted artist um, Gambian artist called Khadija Shea and she was a wonderful young woman uh, and she she perished in the towers and one of the things that has become apparent since that disaster is that there was um, terribly bad insulation of knowledge uh, the, the council that was running the tower blocks and their groupings, they didn't connect and pass information along the chain about concerns. Uh, there was a terribly bad um, network where, you know, the residents were in one corner, the management were in another corner, and time played a disastrous critical factor because of all sorts of things. Now, you could say, like Boeing might say, that these were what Nassim Nicholas Taleb calls black swan events. But I think they're also social health events. I think they are also things that when we say, what were the knowledge flows? What was the strength of the networks? And what were, what time factors were involved? And these are your not, the K-N-O-T concept. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'm just like one of these people, you see your own theory everywhere. But I do see the theory of social health in a lot of different places. I'd love to come back and talk to you again sometime. If you no, it's been great. I really appreciate, appreciate you giving me all the time you have. My guest for this show has been Julia Hasbaum. She is the author of the book, Fully Connected, Social Health in an Age of Overload. Thanks so much for being on the show. My pleasure. So one last thing. You have any observation, like a blurb for uh, my book? Oh, I think it's the, it's of the moment. This is the conversation we should be having and you're having it. All right. Thank you so much. Pleasure.